Good afternoon and welcome. We're just waiting a few moments for people to file in through uh, the virtual waiting room. Thanks for your patience. We'll get started shortly. And again, good afternoon. We're just giving people a few moments to file in from our virtual waiting room before we get started with this afternoon's talk. And once again, good afternoon. My name is Bill Maurer. I'm the Dean of the School of Social Sciences and the Director of the Institute for Money, Technology and Financial Inclusion here at UC Irvine. And I am delighted to welcome you to this afternoon's talk by Karina Sass entitled Blockchain Trust, Stakeholders Perspectives on Cryptocurrency Transactions. Uh, this event is being recorded and it will be posted later on the website of the Institute for Money, Technology and Financial Inclusion. I'll begin with a land acknowledgement. Um, this event and the UC Irvine campus are within the ancestral and unceded shared territories of the Achaman and Tongva peoples. The region extends from the Santa Ana River to Aliso Creek and beyond. As members of a land grant institution, we acknowledge the Achaman and Tongva peoples as the traditional land caretakers whose efforts to steward and protect the land continue today. And again, thank you so much for joining us for this talk by Karina Sass. Uh, this is an opportunity for uh, Professor Sass, who is visiting us from the School of Computing and Communications at Lancaster University in the UK, to further her research on financial technologies with an emphasis on how people perceive, use, and understand them. And today, um, she'll be talking about blockchain. Um, Karina Sass is a professor in human computer interaction, um, a widely published author, and an award winning author whose work has garnered significant funding. Um, from various sources in the UK and elsewhere. She is part of the editorial board of ACM Transactions in Human Computer Interaction and the Taylor and Francis Human Computer Interaction Journals. During this academic year, she has been on sabbatical on a sort of grand tour of California campuses, um, having visited UC Santa Cruz first and now UC Irvine and next Stanford. And I am delighted to hand the floor over now to Professor Sass. Thank you, Bill, for the introduction. I'm really delighted to be here. And despite all the challenges we've been going through uh, for the last year, to be able to materialize this sabbatical and, uh, and be at Irvine. So um, I will just start the presentation. So this, this talk is really an overview of uh, some of my research I've done and uh, with a specific focus on trust on blockchain technology uh, has been done with uh, a, a group of, of colleagues, collaborators, and primarily with one of my PhD students uh, over the last uh, five years or so. So just for a bit of a background, I do have um, a degree in psychology, uh, another one in, in mathematics and computer science, and I do love working at interdisciplinary on interdisciplinary topics. And uh, I think this, this talk today will illustrate that. So I will start with a very brief overview of the Keystone stakeholders of blockchain technology and the different levels of trust that we have focused on through a range of studies. So we started this exploration proposing an earlier research framework to really understand and to start looking at trust on blockchain technologies. Uh, this framework was built on HCI research on trust and identified three levels of trust, technological, so, so social and institutional, and mapped those levels of trust uh, against four Bitcoin uh, blockchain stakeholders, users, merchants, exchanges, and miners. Now, all of you know, users are people who use Bitcoins, merchants are businesses which accept Bitcoins as medium of exchange. Exchanges are providers of online trading platforms where registered members can exchange their Bitcoins for traditional currency and vice versa. And miners record transactions after they have successfully solved crypto puzzles. Now, technological trust is people's trust in the blockchain technology before, during, and after engaging in transactions. Social trust is a trust that stakeholders develop among each other, either across or within different categories of stakeholders. And of course, then we have the institutional trust, 
key here is the trust of government in institu institutions in the blockchain technology. But we'll see that there is a, a different side of institutional trust as we progress with the, with the different studies that we have done. So we have looked at stakeholders' trust uh, in blockchain through empirical work um, engaging with Bitcoin uh, users, miners, and experts. And uh, I will also introduce a new design tool, Blockit, that we have developed and evaluated, whose aim is to materialize the inner working of blockchain for a range of novice audiences in order to support their engagement and better designing of blockchain-based solutions. As you might know, corporate world is very keen to, 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 to engage with blockchain technology and tailor it for their specific, uh, for specific needs. But there is a lot of um, challenges of understanding the inner working of the blockchain. So the first empirical work uh, focused on, uh, on users of Bitcoin, people who engage in, in Bitcoin transactions. So let me just start to tell you that um, at the time that we have done this work, this was actually the first work on blockchain technology that was published in our flagship conference. This is a, a CHI conference uh, by the, sponsored by the Association of Computing Machinery, ACM. And it was, as you can see, was published in 2017. So by then, most of the work in trust on HCI, which is my discipline, human computer interaction, has been informed by e-payment systems which are traditionally centralized, regulated, and non-anonymous. Now, in contrast, as you can see with our research framework as well, blockchain has been purposefully designed as decentralized, unregulated, and pretty much non, uh, pretty much anonymous. Okay, it, it is pseudo-anonymous, but you, you get the drift, completely different than the type of models uh, and frameworks we have in, a, in HCI area to conceptualize trust. So, and also, in addition, most of the research on blockchain at that time took place in the field of cryptography, security, and peer-to-peer -peer computing areas. Of course, there is quite a bit of work in social sciences, but in anything related to computing has been pretty much from security research that has been emerged. And in contrast, work from HCI has been much more limited and very little with lo looking at people really using this technology. And this is the kind of thing we, we wanted to address, the gap we wanted to address. So for this, we try to uh, identify some very specific research questions. And of course, trust has been very, very relevant for us. And I will unpack a little bit later, a little bit more why. But to start with, the three research questions we looked at were, which were the motives for early adoption and use users of Bitcoins? How different blockchain characteristics impact on various dimensions of trust? And which are the main trust challenges? And how do people attempt to mitigate them? So um, I will start by saying that trust is the willingness to be vulnerable and concerns the relationship between people on one hand and technology on the other hand. But we can also think about trust among people themselves interacting with technology, so people with people. And trust factors are users' perception of technology. Uh, and particular here, we have ease of use, risk and credibility. Credibility has several dimensions, uh, perceived honesty, expertise, predictability, and reputation. Trust has also been conceptualized um, with respect to some specific properties of technology. And we talk here about contextual and intrinsic properties. I'm not gonna bore you with definitions, but I'm just gonna briefly tell you what contextual properties of trust are. And this is pretty much something about temporality, how parties engage in future transactions, and therefore they develop interest in the relationship longevity. And in order for this to take place, uh, people rely on traceability of repeated interaction. Right? In this way, people can also build reputation based on reviews of trustees' past performance. And also there is also in terms of contextual properties, we talk about institutional aspects, legal um, uh, underpinning of transaction. So therefore people can enforce sanctions such as litigations or punishment for parties not fulfilling their agreement. Interesting property of trust 
relate to uh, trustee ability or motivation to act in a trustworthy manner. And this has to do with integrity, respect for moral principles, benevolence, and they all kind of support these rich ongoing relationships. If you do not want to develop trust, uh, if you're not interested in long-term relationship, trust is not really a concern for either party. Because in a sense, once the relationship is, uh, transgression of trust occurs, there is no concern because no future relationship uh, are, 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 um, are targeted by either party. But if, if the longevity relationship is important, people are always trying to, to, to foster trust. And you can see on the slide there, I'm identifying the key things which can be problematic for trust. And the dark purple shows that our regulation is a, one of the one of the property of the blockchain by design, the blockchain is, is designed to be unregulated. It's really linked to the idea of sanctions. So you cannot, um, people are really, uh, cannot apply sanctions for transgressions of trust. And the rest of the things which is light, more purple color are linked to the idea of anonymity. And to some extent also decentralization, but particularly anonymity. So we recruited 20 Bitcoin users, uh, predominantly male, um, most of them with at least two years of experience of using Bitcoins. And we really asked them about their motives of using Bitcoins, their perceived benefits and challenges, particularly trust issues, and um, their explanation of various mitigation strategies that they have already started to use. So uh, the findings show that, um, first of all, Bitcoin has a very limited use as a currency, but mostly as a store of value. And this is really pretty for protecting people's savings in an unstable economy and for, from untrusty governments and banks. People are also interested in the speculation related to the Bitcoin's future value. Um, most participants appreciate the Bitcoin transactions because they do not involve financial institutions, which arguably they see as dishonest. Um, they also appreciate the ease and the very prompt way in which transactions on blockchain can take place, sometimes um, much perceived as being less complicated than banks' authorization process, processes. And they also like the unregulated aspect of blockchain. It allows them to regain control over own money, their own assets, with no restriction over where the money could travel. So in such decentralized and unregulated systems, people perceive the risk of abuse of power of financial institutions as being much less, much less, much uh, far more limited. People also appreciate blockchain's characteristics supporting trust. And as I said before, the public ledger, the transparency of transactions, that everything is being captured on the public ledger. So they can see the movement of, uh, of Bitcoins from one electronic wallet to another. They also perceive these as transactions as being relatively low cost, again, compared with those uh, with financial transactions through the banks. And um, again, very ease of use and speed. I already touched upon this issue. So lots of positive about blockchain. And these are all things that support trust in blockchain technology. Now, what are the aspects that hinder trust? Well, um, it's very interesting because the trust uh, it's not hindered by aspects related to the technology itself, to the blockchain technology, because pretty much people trust the cryptographic protocol for authorizing transactions. However, uh, have been many concerns about insecure transactions, which have been linked to people themselves. So there is a social dimension of trust that comes here very, very strongly. And this is because of human error, human malice, or even blockchain limitation to address either of these two uh, human factors. So we identify three human factors as causes of insecure transaction. And I said the first relates to the users themselves, especially the risk of losing their wallet password or insufficiently protecting it. And of course, this has dramatic consequences for losing the Bitcoins themselves. The second relates to other party engaged in transactions, such as dishonest partners, traders. A quarter of participants reported incidents where either themselves or very close friends have suffered such transgression of trust. And finally, we have third human party not engaged in transactions, malicious hackers and phishing emails targeting wallet passwords. And people have been also victim of something like such kind of um, uh, insecure transactions and problems. 
one third of participants consider themselves responsible to secure their Bitcoins. Few, however, indicated that recovery from users' failure to protect passwords from hackers or from hackers' attack is limitedly supported by blockchain because its transactions cannot be reversed. And again, this is an interesting thing because by design, blockchain uh, features non-reversible transaction, which was um, initially put forward as a way to address uh, the bank's privilege of allowing reversible transaction, even when the contract uh, states that the transaction is final. So we're circumventing some of the problems of the current uh, financial system, but people found problematic when they are being victims of uh, social uh, concerns of insecure transactions due to uh, mistrusting uh, partners. So it's just, you see how features of blockchain are becoming problematic when social trust comes into the equation. And here is another important decision that we identified. Um, between the transactions captured on blockchain, and we know the data structures on blockchain allow the transfer of Bitcoins from one wallet to another to be captured on the, on the, on the public ledger. However, people perceive transactions as two ways transfer of Bitcoin from one to another and transfer of money or goods, which happens offline and definitely not through the blockchain. So with the exception of one way remittance transactions, all other transactions are two ways. Both parties sending and receiving assets such as fiat currency and goods exchange for Bitcoins. However, participants were able to track on blockchain only one side of the transaction, the movement of Bitcoins. And this raised major risk in relation to dishonest traders because the second part was never captured and transgressions of trust related to the second part, again, could never be uh, documented. Blockchain doesn't have that facility. So we now discuss a couple of mitigation strategies with respect to dishonest uh, traders. Um, these were some of the most heated concerns raised by the people in our study, participants in our study. And the running teams here was um, traders' anonymity and the unregulation of blockchain. And to address it, the preferred option was for people to engage with exchanges because exchanges are authorized by financial services, have credible websites, and most importantly, require sellers and buyers to register, register and have their identities, identities verified. So in a way, they circumvent the anonymity of a blockchain and they work with exchanges. So only with known people that can, whose real identity can be tracked. This is the strongest risk mitigation strategy for dealing with dishonest transaction partners. A weaker one is socially authorized traders, uh, people known within a community and therefore, uh, for example, within an online group, and therefore trust, trust, trust is being uh, engendered through that community. And then we have reputable traders benefit by credibility by proxy. A few group members vote for a specific, uh, for a specific uh, trader and therefore reputation is being built. But again, this is something that happens not on blockchain. It's all about a community built around it. And the weaker strategy is engaging in transaction with de-anonymized traders uh, because people actually meet face to face to uh, make the transaction itself. Bitcoins are exchanged on, through the blockchain, obviously, but the goods and the other fiat currency is exchanged face to face. So finally, many participants also express the wish that blockchain becomes regulated to specifically address this challenge, this social challenge. And this is again a very important finding because indicates a higher level strategy, which does not add to the trading itself, it's, but it's related to the unregulated nature of the blockchain. So which are the implications of this work? So while the technological trust in blockchain is strong, the social dimension raises significant challenges by insecure transactions, as we said, uh, uh, particularly due to the dishonest traders. And, um, our findings highlight this kind of tension, an interesting tension. Bitcoin users desire regulation because of dealing with dishonest traders, but at the same time, they welcome uh, unregulated nature because they do not want to engage with financial institutions. So we do argue that users' desire for regulation relates to, uh, to the new forms of thinking that a disruptive technology like blockchain demands. It provides freedom from banking system and increased control over one's assets which many participants enjoy. 
but at the same time, it no longer provides the security that regulated financial institutions provide and which users have been accustomed to. So we argue that at present, Bitcoin users continue to operate under the old mindsets of the fiat money in traditional centralized and regulated financial systems and might need support, additional support to develop new mental models, understanding the underpinning of the unregulated blockchain technology. Um, so traditionally in order to be trusted, partners need to build a, together a history as we discussed, and this is not something that can, it's currently supported by blockchain. As a result, people start challenging even the anonymity of the blockchain as a, as a key design feature. So what can you learn from these findings regarding the design of more socially trustworthy blockchain technology? So almost all transactions reported in the study are two ways, we already mentioned that. Um, and uh, to address this, we can imagine new tools for digitally capturing the offline transactions as well, which are not currently captured by the public ledger, to ensure that it's, their transfer is also verified, authorized, and stored on the public ledger. The content of the transaction is often fiat currency, and blockchain already provides mechanisms for creating, for example, digital tokens by fiat currency or even physical goods. So this is something that can be further explored. We also suggest new tools for materializing trust in blockchain. And as I'll continue with the presentation, we already uh, explored through the block kit uh, as a new design method that we have already developed. And we can also think of a reputation management system built on top of blockchain, which can support social trust among traders. Um, irre irreversible Bitcoin transactions are also problematic. And one way of addressing this is by exploring new mechanisms for reversing individual two-way transactions on top of the irreversible blockchain trans protocol. One solution here could be new tools for enabling the de-anonymization of the owner of disposable wallet address, discarded after one use, or tools supporting multi-signature transactions. The latter has been already enabled on blockchain, but no participants has mentioned its use. So there is a sense of increasing, again, digital literacy around blockchain. So in the light of this study um, with Bitcoin users, we can now revisit our initial research questions. And I'm just putting the same diagram again, and I just unpacked a little bit more the social trust layer that you can see. Uh, the four identified strategies for mitigating trust in dishonest uh, transaction partners are highlighted here. Uh, I'm also uh, pinpointing here that institutional trust can be seen two, way, two ways, not just government trust in blockchain, but also Bitcoin trust, users trust in government. And findings show a significant erosion of trust in the traditional centralized financial institutions. So we continue our work by looking now at a different stakeholder group, Bitcoin miners. Um, for those of you who are less familiar, I don't think there are many here, but just in case, miners operate as a distributed network of people who both collaborate and compete with each other to solve algorithmic problems for validating transactions. And the, the mining practice occurs in the absence of any central authority. Uh, being regulating it so it's completely decentralized as well as fully transparent. Any validated transaction is recorded on the public ledger and can long, no longer be modified. So, and for their work uh, on va for validating transactions, miners are financially rewarded. So, um, we focused on this study with miners on uh, four research questions, which are their motives for mining, different blockchain characteristics impacting on miners' trust. Um, how is a mining practice socially organized and what specific mine uh, trust challenges miners have and how do they start already mitigating them if they have? So we recruited 20 Bitcoin miners. Again, all of them are male. You can see this is a very gendered practice. Um, 16 of them have over one year of mining experience and eight of them, so almost half, over four years of mining. And um, again, we run interviews with them and we wanted to explore their motives, their perceived benefits and challenges of mining and particularly trust issues and mitigating strategies. So findings show that almost half of the participants mine because of financial rewards. 
uh, they also enjoy the limited regulation regarding taxation of such rewards. And fewer uh, really enjoy mining because they like to experience with the blockchain technology. And so it's pretty much an epistemic curiosity there. Um, so findings also revealed blockchain's characteristics supporting miners' trust. First is the decentralized and transparent uh, aspect of mining protocol. And these are particularly valued by all participants. Miners also perceive the unregulated aspect of the mining practice uh, very favorably because it limits the perceived, perceived risk of banks and governments to control mining activities. And finally, this came as a surprise, but mining practice is considered easy, um, not requiring advanced technical skills. And now, a considerable set of findings highlighted challenges that people have with respect to trust, factors related to blockchain hindering trust. And we can see an interesting parallel with what we found from the previous study. It is not so much the blockchain itself as a technology, but again, the social layer around blockchain that creates these uh, issues of trust. Uh, in particular, the social aspect of mining and its competitiveness. So let's first have a look at how this practice evolved. Our findings indicate three types of mining practices performed either individually or collectively, and these are the two columns on this, on this table, or on people's own machines or on leased machines, machines that they borrow. And these are the two uh, rows in this table. So 16 of our participants started mining between 2010, 2012, and they use what we call home solo method of mining. They mined at home on their own personal computers. At that time, the difficulty of mining was rather low, but later due to the increased competitiveness, miners needed to upgrade their machines while running and maintenance costs also increased. Therefore, four of these initial miners discontinue mining with the rest of them moving towards collaborative mining by joining home pools while still using their own machines. In this situation, the profit was divided according to the amount of power each miners contributed to the pool. But again, due to further increase in cost and particularly those for continual upgrading of their machines, eight participants forced to discontinue their practice of mining. The remaining four moved towards collective mining on leased machines. One became a data center owner, while the other three participants started mining on leased machines in data center or so-called cloud mining. Findings indicate three types of miners. One is the mining pool administrators uh, who facilitate miners access to mining pools. These type of miners have advanced skills to set up, run and maintain the machine within the pool. Then we have the second layer, data center administrators who provide end miners opportunity for leasing machines hosted and maintained within the data centers. And finally, at the bottom of the pyramid, we have end miners who can have very limited technical skills, even lower than those required for home solo miners in the very beginning of mining practices. And this is because they merely pay for leasing the machines in the larger pools. Hence, we can see a serious and continual de-skilling of miners as they move towards collective mining. Also, in contrast with pool administrators, end miners have limited power. And in order to remain competitive, they have to follow the trend set by the pool administrator, continually increasing in leasing fees for the demand of operating machines to ensure competitiveness. So this pyramid indicates power concentrated away from the end miners and potential trust issues between each of these three types of miners. So therefore, the social mining practice moves towards centralization as miner needs to migrate towards collective miners pulling their resources together. And this is associated with end miners distrust in this owner's pool and data centers administrators. Such risks are due to the lack of audit for the distribution of rewards in the pools and also the invisibility of some of the data centers. They could be exclusively in the cloud with no information on their physical presence. And we know the physical presence of any corporate institution uh, engender trust. 
Findings also indicate two strategies of end miners for mitigating these challenges of collaborative mining. They can choose reputable pools, and that's why we can see that most miners are part of the, the few three or four major pools. And that's again, it's a trend that supports the, um, uh, the pr mining practice to become very, very concentrated in, in, a, in a very, in a, in a way it's becoming, it's collaborative, but at the same time, it's, it's less distributed, it's, 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 um, it's concentrated within very few pools. And there are big, big issues with that. Miners also can start build their own decentralized pools. And we've seen some efforts of that like P2P pool without the need for pool administrators. But this can only be done by miners with very strong technical skills and it's not uh, uh, an avenue that and miners are interested to pursue. So they do face um, interesting, interesting challenges. To address the risk of centralization of mining practices, what we can do? Well, we can think of authoring tools for supporting and miners development of these decentralized pools with no central administrators because they do need this support. As I said, the technical skills are not so strong. Also, to address the social trust challenge of dishonest administrators, we can imagine new tools for monitoring hash power and reward distribution in data centers and mining pools. So that would be a way to build reputation and allow people to see the transparency of these distribution of awards addressing the challenge of dishonest uh, administrators. So in the light of these findings, we went back to our initial framework and we can see again, we revise even further, the, the, particularly the middle layer of social trust by adding the, the mitigation strategies that miners are developing. At the institutional level, we again see the distrust in the financial institution that, not, uh, that um, miners have adding already to the uh, mistrust of Bitcoin users that we already uh, articulated earlier. So these are the work that we've done with these specific stakeholders. And the final bit of work I'm going to talk about, I'm talking on my time, I'm fine, is block it. So I usually ask the audience, uh, how many of you have worked with or designed for blockchain? Um, I cannot see you now because I'm sharing my screen, but ponder over this question a little bit. The next question I'm usually asking is, how many of you have understood how blockchain works? Uh, or have helped others understand how blockchain works? And if you engage with any of these questions before, you'll know that they are not trivial questions. And in our next piece of work I'm presenting here, we design and evaluating Blockit, and we call this an innovative approach to answer these questions. So Blockit is a physical kit for communicating and designing for blockchain infrastructure. So let me start with a very brief rationale. So we already say, I mentioned earlier, blockchain is highly innovative technology, decentralized peer-to-peer -peer system. It is also highly disruptive. It challenges fundamental assumptions we have about financial institutions. And therefore has the potential to change many aspects of the digital economy. However, people are less familiar with these new models of thinking around them. And again, blockchain is very complex, reflected in its range of stakeholders and uh, miners work is distributed and collaborative. Um, all this set of issues around blockchain may make it rather complex to get our head around. And even people who have expertise in it will still find issues that they are they, they might find they might, that are a little bit difficult to, to, to fully grasp. And this actually came from our last study. So as a result of all these layers of complexity related to blockchain, it's inner working. And what we call in, in my area, we call them structural mental models. These are things of how technology functions, function, right? This structural mental model that people can develop about blockchain are not trivial to grasp, to understand, to build. Because blockchain fundamentally differs from everything we've known before. And we have also seen different ways through which blockchain mental models are being communicated. We've seen quite a few visualizations, uh, infographics, uh, even videos, which are good because they show some temporal unfolding of how different things move around on blockchain. Um, 
In contrast, the value of the physical object has been limited explored. And at the time we did this work, uh, we were aware of just one work trying to use Lego to materialize some of the aspects related to blockchain. But it's been very, very limited work and it was quite inspirational for us to do the work that I'm gonna present now. So we argue that there is an untapped potential of physical three-dimensional objects, not only to communicate about blockchain, but also to support the understanding of the properties of the blockchain's key concepts. And that's how we came to build Blockit and we evaluated with 15 blockchain experts. So in order to build this kit, we draw inspiration from material center design and embodied cognition theories. Um, so we engage with different materials, clay, paper, magnetic sand, wood, metal safe boxes, or transparent containers, in order to identify the important properties of the blockchain key concepts, and therefore use this understanding to materialize these concepts through physical objects. So um, the key objects that we identify pretty much from previous HCI research and security, uh, security research are bitcoins, wallet, wallet password, keys, both private and public. These are key elements involved in transactions. And we also identify concepts related to miners work such as computational power, consensus rule, block, proof of work, and it's timestamp and the public ledger. And here we have the specific objects representing these concepts in the final version of the block it. So we work with these objects until we really understand the properties. It was very much an iterative process, but the final set of objects is presented here. So first is a Bitcoin themselves. These are made of plastic, plasticine, so they are divisible. I'm gonna talk about properties in a little bit. Then we have the wallet. This is represented through a clear, clear plastic box with a coin slot to allow for the visibility of depositing coins, as well as a toggle latch to ensure security. Uh, the wallet password represented through a metal padlock and its key, which can also be displaced and no longer found. We know the risk of this happening, but at the same time, both the padlock and its key are made of durable metal material to symbolize the start sturdy character of the password. Um, to represent the public key, okay, the public key and their transient character, we explore sticky notes. Since these are made of paper, are less durable or safe. And through the ability to attach themselves to other objects, sticky notes are good for communicating public keys ability to be attached to and travel with a, wallet, with a wallet. We also provided an additional black envelope, as you can see in this, in the, in the late, late um, in the piece of the screen that I framed late, uh, latest in red. Uh, these black envelopes are used for the private key. Uh, to communicate its ability to become private, right? The public, it can become pr pr uh, private when it's being hidden. Uh, miners' computational power, it's here, right? Is linked to their machines. And first we thought to represent it through a mini miniature model of a PC, but we realized that this fails to capture the variation of power. So we used instead a battery power object such as candlelight, candlelight whose variation in brightness level can be controlled to metaphorically represent different levels of computational power. More bright is more power. Proof of work involves solving a numerical problem. So we use post-it papers and pen as symbolic tools for solving the problem. And then we have a timestamp for uh, time stamping the proof of work. And um, we have a set of boxes. So uh, for block, we use um, uh, which holds a collection of unconfirmed transactions, which use a transparent plastic box that can be open and closed, but not necessarily locked. And then we also represent the consensus rules. I'm not insisting on those. And I'm just gonna go straight to the uh, blockchain ledger for which you use a plastic sheet on which we draw confirmed blocks organized in a grid as a metaphor for the interrelationship among blocks. Now, by working with these different materials, we also identify their properties. Some of them I already highlighted in what I presented so far. 
Um, and here is a complete list of the properties characterizing this concept, but I'm going to illustrate them with respect to just one concept, Bitcoins. So three of these properties are those characterizing money in general. Fungible, Bitcoins are interchangeable. Divisible, is Bitcoin, each Bitcoin can be divided into 100 million smaller parts. And scarce, as the total number of Bitcoin is capped to 21 million. Bitcoins are also durable, as they are meant to last indefinitely. Private, as their ownership is private. Portable, as uh, their owner, owner, owner can uh, transfer them, and they can be also hosted on multiple devices. And of course, verifiable, as each Bitcoin transaction is recorded on the public ledger. Um, we also um, explore image schemata, but in interest of time, I'm not gonna insist on these things. The key image schemata use is container and part whole, and this is uh, a concept borrowed from uh, uh, embodied cognition theories. If you are interested, you can look at the paper and I can take questions later. Um, I'm not going to insist on this aspect now. So briefly, let me tell you, uh, let me go through the study. So we uh, work with 15 Bitcoin experts. Again, as you can see, predominantly male, uh, quite experienced in blockchain technology, and we run workshops with them. First of all, we uh, um, wanted to explore their mental model of blockchain and also how trust can be materialized on blockchain, something that is not currently available, right, at the time we run the study at least. So we start showing participants the block kit and ask them to simulate Bitcoin transactions while thinking aloud. And then we also provided two round shaped pieces of clay, one green, one red, representing trust and distrust tokens, and ask participants to include them in their Bitcoin transactions while thinking aloud. So uh, findings show, participants strong enjoyment while using the kit. Uh, due to the powerful analogies, particularly for computational power, timestamp, bitcoins, and wallet, the key concepts of blockchain. And such positive emotions lasted throughout the entire study as people were picking up the objects and interacting with them, often with great delight. Findings also indicate that the recognition of objects was supported by the qualities of the materials that we have used. For example, transparency helped the identification of wallet and block. Portability was clearly recognized, particularly for miners computational power. Divisibility was also valued with respect to Bitcoin. Somebody said, obviously this yellow plasticine is Bitcoins and I can pinch in whatever size to show the amount being spent. In terms of participant experience of Blockit, all people initiated spontaneous interaction with the objects. They all place the Bitcoins into the wallet through the physical gesture of opening the container and placing the yellow clay inside, like we've seen the image. Um, also participants took distinct roles, uh, sometimes users, sometimes the miners, because of course you had the proof of work and the timestamp there as well. So this was an interesting shift of roles that, that, uh, that, that appear. I think we have, um, uh, that this is when they become minors on the final, final, uh, the two, the last column on this on the slide, the one before they actually they try to actions. Okay, they, I think they're interacting with the wall with the, with their wallets um, and uh, with the protocol. That's what's happening on the on the one marked in purple. So all these gestures facilitated think aloud for about half of the participants, but this is an important outcome because. Experts' mental models are quite difficult to capture. Uh, much research in mental models in HCI identify that. So the fact that at least half of the participants continue thinking aloud while working through this was a, was a rather positive outcome from the study. Um, so um, what, looking back at the findings, now I'm just trying to, to go towards concluding here. Um, the block it allowed people to develop a more nuanced understanding of a blockchain and even to articulate some of the less accurate assumptions they have and the paper unpack how that happened so i don't have time now to go through that but if you're interested you can take that forward um one for example one aspect was that the blockchain and its nodes can be represented as a chain rather than a grid as we did um and uh, 
this is an important finding. It, it shows a different representation in people's mental model of the blockchain is, is really chain and not a grid as we done as, as you've made. Uh, and it's a shift in the underlying metaphor of blockchain. And in the next iteration of the kit, we'll replace the public ledger representation using chain metaphor. So which are the implications of this work? This is my last part. Um, right, so this is where people were working towards um, uh, materializing trust on blockchain, how trust can be materialized. And here we explore several avenues till we came up to the last one and just very briefly mentioned to you. So first is placing the token of trust within the Bitcoin transaction, but this fails to record the offline movement of fiat currency used to pay for Bitcoins. The other one was the other attempt people tried to explore was ensuring two way transparent transaction. And this means embodying trust in both online and offline parties. However, this solution makes the offline transaction non anonymous. So again, was discarded. Then people explore the centralized mediator solution. This is similar to escrow service, which again lacks anonymity and denies the decentralized principle of blockchain. Then people explored two of two multi, multi signature address embedding them in embedding trust in, in both online and offline parts of the transaction. But that again fails to help people dispute uh, fraud, handle disputes of fraud. And then they came with a last solution two of three multi signature address or crowdsourced decentralized mediator identified by eight participants. This solution involves smart contracts. So once the sender and receiver agree to create a transaction, they will be, uh, will be a random third party, a crowdsourced mediator appointed to join the contract. This is responsible to manage dispute. So this is important because it shows how the thinking around blockchain can be supported by our, our design tool. And we concluded with saying that it proved uh, a novel approach to think about uh, designing for infrastructure such as blockchain. Um, that allow people to articulate their thinking uh, around blockchain and even revise it. You can see they change their mental models and novel such tools can be further developed potentially for other infrastructure design, like for example, IoT. And um, I think it's also important to realize that throughout the entire workshops, people, we have to remind, repeatedly remind people the key design principles around blockchain. And we think that this is something that the, the tool itself can, can provide by having sensitizing cards alongside the objects to really keep the awareness of all these fundamental principles around blockchain design that always have to be leveraged because that will support any kind of thinking about developing blockchain-based uh, solutions for whatever corporate uh, uh, application we are thinking about. So I think this is me. I have another slide, but I'm not going to go there. Uh, there is no more time. I want to acknowledge my PhD student. Uh, she uh, has completed now. She, uh, it was a delight to work with her. Now she's associate professor at, at Malay University. And I'm happy to take questions. Stop sharing the screen so I can see you all. Yeah. Thank you so much, Karina. Um, and now I'll invite our attendees to post their questions in the Q&A. Um, and I will moderate those as those pop in. But um, I think I might just kick it off with two of my own and um, one about kind of each part of the talk. I guess what, what struck me in the interviews with the users is that although they were so committed to the kind of decentralization and anonymity um, of blockchain transactions, at the end of the day, they ended up putting their most trust in authorized exchanges, which presumably are like the big corporate ones, right? Coinbase or whatever. Um, so I wanna ask you to reflect on that, but also reflect on that together with the parallel uh, revelation on the miners side um, that ultimately it was the more centralized mining pool administrators um, who had the most power. So I guess my question is about both from the you know, the, the consumer and producer side of, in this case, uh, Bitcoin mining or um, presumably other kinds of blockchain-based cryptocurrencies, even though these things are decentralized and anonymous, ultimately they tend toward centralization. Um, and that, that, that's my first question. Um, 
maybe maybe I'll let you speak to that one first, and then I'll come to the next one while we wait for other people to put theirs in the chat. Yeah, so um, the users, Bitcoin users, they aim towards regulation, I would say, and the miners aim to, towards centralization. I don't think the centralization of the miners' mining practices is something they necessarily want. It's just it's just that it evolves this way because it's so competitive and it's going to become even competitive as the Bitcoin are being are, are going to be mined and more mined towards the end of the of the, of the capped the capped amount. Um, yeah, so I think it's a little bit different. Uh, they cannot fight. They cannot fight. I mean, those who cannot keep keep up, they have to discontinue the practice. And as it, as it happened, if they join the practice, they have to keep up and buy and more and more complex machines. I didn't touch on this presentation at all, but there is a lot of work. Uh, a little bit, at least in HCI, there is a strong uh, sustainability strand coming very very strong, and how green the mining practices are uh, and sustainable. Uh, so yeah, which is again all about increased competitiveness of these machines. Right, so this is about collaboration. Um, I don't think it's desirable, it's just the way it is, the nature of the beast. What users are doing, um, yeah, this is interesting. On the one hand, it's it's us and the government and financial institutions and distrust and therefore unregulation is great. But then us becomes some of us less honest, some of us more honest, and therefore within this us there are problems. The social the social trust is not there. Um, so I I don't think that the anonymization is the solution that they are they're necessarily looking for because of course they are asking for conflicting things. They, they they cannot have it both ways. I think what we need, but I think we need to be aware of this trust and might be other way to address them. And this is a couple of things we try to articulate new design implications for rethinking how trust can be added through the through the blockchain. Uh, and we really try to see how it can be materialized, maybe linked to address, maybe linked to, uh, to sorry to the wallet address. Um, but yeah, I think it's a very complex problem. I do not have all the answers, but. Um, yeah, you're right. It's a huge tension there, and it comes from the social layer. Not oh, thank from you. Not, not from the what? I'm sorry, I cut not you off. Not from the blockchain, te the, the technology itself. It's a way it's being appropriated by all the stakeholders involved. Mm. You know, that's. I'll, I'll save my second question because we have one from the floor, which I think is a nice segue with what you just said about how it's not the blockchain, it's the social layer. And that the question is, you mentioned that this is a highly gendered practice. Um, so how does gender impact dynamics of trust? Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it is gender. It's hugely gendered. Um, we didn't particularly, of course, because we have most male, we didn't pull that dimension. And we found it by the time we recruited uh, recruitment. Uh, it was through social media, through blockchain online groups. We work with a blockchain uh, meetup group in Edinburgh. Um, uh, did, I think we noticed it, but we didn't have a specific research question when we started the study to dig into it. How does it impact trust? Um, I can only specul speculate because um, we didn't we didn't explore it. So I, I don't know I do not know the answer from a, from a very well data the rich data set. Uh, but if I have to think. So it, it, it is clearly linked to power structure, which might also be gendered to some extent. Um, and we've seen that definitely in the mining practices. Um, Bitcoin users, um, I don't know. I would be inclined to think that, for example, um, female Bitcoin users will probably go for more safer way to mitigate, for example, using exchanges rather than going to, to use face online face to face meeting for exchange of offline goods. So maybe they um, gender dimension impact on people using female female users using the going for more safer um, mitigating strategies. That, that's a very, very rough. Uh, I don't have any more data to, to even speculate further. 
but I think it's interesting, yeah. No, thank, thank you. You know, um, turning, turning back to my other original question, you know, with, with BlockKit, um, it seemed like what you were trying to do was to um, provide a forum for cryptocurrency users to kind of visibilize their digital practice, right? And so you make this kit and then you see kind of what they do with it. And um, I, this is more of a comment than a question, I guess. You know, one of the things that's always struck me about uh, the cryptocurrency world is that the metaphors don't really work, right? I mean, there is no coin. Um, there's an entry in a ledger. It's not really a ledger, right? You can go on and on and on. Um, there is actually no exchange, right? I mean, all of the, all the metaphors are wrong. So I'm curious if in kind of playing with the kit, the failure of the metaphors became evident to people or if they somehow tried to force those metaphors into the building blocks that you gave them. Yeah, that's interesting. So we we wanted to get metaphors as 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 right as we could, and these objects weren't just came up. They were a part of a very solid engaging with the material and really articulating those. And actually, I do work with metaphors on other areas of my work. We have metaphors for for, for mindfulness, for meditation states. I, I work a lot in well being as well. Um, so so that's. I would say we try to put forward good metaphors. Now I'm not sure they were necessarily perfect, but what so and we also we didn't explore people's previous pre previous metaphors that they have, but we try to use a metaphor as a lens to get to understand their models, their mental model of blockchain in, inners working. And this is something that it really helped. And and some of the metaphors, you know, we talk metaphors have um, superficial similarities and structural similarities. Uh, so those who have both are easy to recognize and then easy to understand in at the deep level how the mapping occurs. And some of them were much easier to grasp. Some of them weren't quite as good. So definitely we have to rethink, for example, the block. Uh, we also have to rethink the ledger. Uh, and we see the metaphor of the chain rather than the metaphor of the, of the grid that we put initially. And in a way also help us refine their own, our own assumptions and understanding of blockchain. It happens, my PhD student really understood things better. But the fact that blockchain experts who took part in the workshop changed their thinking about some key aspects of the blockchain and some of the assumptions, this is very powerful stuff. This is when you see something is transformative when a tool allow people to change assumptions. And this happened. Um, so, as I said, we didn't explore their own previous metaphors, we looked specifically at the metaphor as a way to explore the models, and the models were the one that we targeted, and I think it really worked in that respect. I can see a question from Farah, I'm trying to read it. Um, environmental impact concerns. Yeah, it's interesting. No, none of the environmental impact surfaced. Now, I also have to say, in all honesty, it is a research that has been done uh, quite early in time. Um, so the awareness of the sustainability issues were very strong, but the Bitcoin users and the Bitcoin miners as well, but definitely the users, we uh, recruited them from Malaysian um, uh, mailing list and uh, and on face groups so the fact that it was in a developing context might bear some some something on on this environmental awareness um no we didn't get any of those concerns and we didn't dig into those at that point wasn't something that we were fully aware of, of either to put it as a research question uh well what regulation would they get in the way of their work on how um well, yeah, Malaysia actually is embracing uh, blockchain. It was one of the governments quite open to, towards blockchain rather than sanctioning it. So I think it probably was another good choice for us to explore it there. Um, so they didn't express concerns for, for that not being able to use it or, or not being legal. They even were aware that they don't pay tax on the income and they were super happy with that. <laughs> um, well, and then you'll see the next the next question actually is about tax. Um, we can see if suddenly the income tax authorities 
developed a way to trace crypto transactions, what do you think would happen to the rapid growth curve? Uh, you know, we know, sense? of course. And this is this question is is today more current than ever, I would say. Um, yeah, but it didn't surface surface to the work we've done. I mean, our people were were buying goods. I mean, they actually they didn't spend the Bitcoin so much. And if they did, it was again probably a bit more experimental, try to buy it with fiat currency and probably I think we, we found some services being bought the paper capture if I recall correctly a couple of couple of services nothing bad <laughs> but they were buying some things through through the bitcoins and the bitcoin also bear in mind was not where it is today the value of it wasn't so high I think they were far more cautious about buying goods with it um, so yeah no issues about tax fully surfaced in the way that you'd expect if you run the study today. Um, it was too early days, I would say. And you see the next next question about the possible regulatory environment and typical background and expertise required. Wow! If I knew the answer for that. <laughs> um, that's interesting. So. We did some of our work on um, um, on let me just see. We do know that there is a lot of interest, at least in the UK, and I would expect here as well, from especially our NHS is interested, lots of uh, health organizations are interested in the, for example, blockchains application to health. Uh, there's a lot of a lot to do with health records and that's all no all known but it's such a hot hot um, technology disruptive but people see it as a holy grail now uh, let's get on the blockchain and let lots of lots of things we're gonna we're gonna get better but i don't think necessarily people know how to articulate the benefits of blockchain and embed it into their into their businesses. I think this that's why I, I, I was very keen to work on the block kit, try to see that understanding. Actually, we try now to build this kit and make it modularized in a way that uh, you know it can be put in a little box and taken with us. We try to even work with financial advisors and try to take it forward and get businesses engaged and try to see how their more than about the work can be. Uh, uh, I can see people are running. We're running, running, running out of time. Um, yeah, how how can change the models? But I will not necessarily know how to support the regulation. I think you have to work with the cabinet. Uh, what is in the UK? This is something that we can do. Yeah, well, we, we probably should wrap up as I see people are um, drifting off. Probably people have 4 p.m. classes or other <laughs> um, engagements. But Karina, thank you so much for this talk. Thank you all for coming. Um, as I said, this has been recorded and will be posted on the IMTFI website later on. I want to acknowledge Jenny Fan for all of her work behind the scenes to make it happen. Um, and I hope everyone has a lovely rest of your day. Thank you, Karina, and take care, Thank everybody. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye.